You're listening to The Diplomats Podcast on Asian geopolitics. As always, I'm your host, Ankit Panda, recording from a very snowy Washington, D.C. And I'm your co-host, Catherine Putz, uh, Katie Putz, whatever you want to call me. And I am also back in Washington, D.C. How's it going, Katie? Pretty good. Yeah, Katie and I were just talking about what a long month January 2022 is starting to feel like. Uh, there's a lot going on in the world. Uh, it seems like a lot has happened since our last episode on Kazakhstan. Um, today, we will talk about North Korea. Um, but, um, you know, Katie, why don't I pass it over to you to sort of lead this one? Because I feel like I'm going to do a lot of the talking. Yes, I, I think Ankit is the right person to talk to about North Korea. And I'm going to ask him questions about it. Um, so in January, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, there have been six rounds of missile tests from North Korea. Uh, can you kind of put that into context? Is that pace? Is that clustering unusual? Uh, everybody's been talking about this. So I have the inkling that it is, but um, can you just fill well, us in there? Yeah. So, so look, the fact that North Korea has missiles that they want to test is not a surprise. What is surprising is seeing this pace of testing. So January 2022, by my count, is the busiest month in North Korean history for missile testing. There have been 10 individual missiles tested. The last month that was the highest was March 2020, when I believe there were nine tests. So they've they've beat their old record by one. Um, but what's particularly unusual is January is usually a month where the North Koreans don't launch too many missiles. Um, mm. And the reason for that historically was because the Korean People's Army does what's known as their winter training cycle. So this is when, you know, the infantry units, uh, mechanized units, uh, um, artillery units conduct large scale field mobilization exercises under very brutal winter conditions. Winters in North Korea are not very pleasant generally. Um, and so it's interesting that we're seeing this right now. Um, there's a few hypotheses that I have for why specifically January 2022, you know, one of them is that Kim Jong-un's 10th anniversary in power is still being celebrated in the country. Mm -hmm. COVID-19 with the food shortages and concerns about transmission could have led to the winter training cycle being downsized. And so doing mm -hmm. highly visible missile tests is a way to sort of shore up propaganda internally. But yeah, there's not really a solid uh, explanation for, um, you know, why exactly January 2022 is uh, is is seeing this um, big surge in missile testing. But, you know, otherwise we can talk about, you know, the reasons why the North Koreans are generally focusing on developing their capabilities right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, wa I wanted to ask sort of what kind of missiles has North Korea been testing? And, you know, are these are these tests more a propaganda tool or are they a sort of a technical tool for the development of North Korean sort of missile technology? I imagine it's a bit of both, but can you kind of sort through um, both the propaganda value and then just the technical expertise testing of new weapons or, or um, things that have been in the pipeline? Yeah. So, I mean, what I usually point out is that there's never, you know, the North Koreans never launch missiles or conduct demonstrations of military capability for a single reason, right? There's always multiple mm -hmm. explanations. I think the overarching primary reason, uh, you know, to use Occam's razor, is that you test missiles because you want to know if your missiles work, <laughs> right? That's why the United States and other countries do, do weapons testing and the North Koreans are no different. So that's the primary reason is that they see the mm -hmm. need to develop these capabilities for conventional and nuclear deterrence purposes, and they want to test them and make sure they work and advance their capabilities. Um, but then, yeah, Katie, I mean, you know, there is an internal impetus to uh, indicate especially right now for Kim Jong-un, right? He's been very open about the fact that the economy is probably in the worst position that it's been since he inherited power in uh, December 2011 after his father died. Um, agricultural output uh, was a big theme in his New Year's Day address on January 1st this year, uh, which, you know, suggests that either North Korea is looking at famine-like conditions very soon or is already enduring a famine in part of the country. It's, it's very difficult mm. to say given that our insight into North Korea is more limited than it used to be before because aid workers, diplomats have poured out of the country um, since the mm -hmm. pandemic lockdown happened. Uh, and then there's, of course, the external aspect, which I think a lot of Western uh, writing and reporting tends to focus on, you know, is this a test for Joe Biden? Uh, you know, what does this say <laughs> to the United States and South Korea? And, you know, that's usually, usually like, most North Korean missile tests are not about the United States. You know, Americans can mm -hmm. be very narcissistic and assume that everything that happens in the world is about testing our president uh, in some way. But, um, but you know, that said, there is an undercurrent to this. Uh, there's been this pattern historically that the North Koreans uh, develop their capabilities because they feel that that gives them leverage to come to the diplomatic negotiating table. That's what kind of happened between 
2013 and 2017, which led into the mm-hmm. diplomacy in 2018 and 2019, which collapsed. And then now we have a new sort of testing campaign. So I think that's also part of the story here. Um, so there's there's a lot going on. Uh, and the broader context that I should probably emphasize, uh, which we've talked about on the, on the podcast before last year, was that, you know, before Joe Biden was inaugurated, the North Koreans held a party congress, which is pretty much the most important political event in their uh, system. Uh, it's a way to sort of set... Uh, not only an economic plan for the five years um, that would precede it, uh, but also a military modernization plan, which Kim Jong-un laid out in some detail. And he basically said, you know, we want all kinds of new missiles. We want better missiles. We want more missiles, qualitative and quantitative growth. Uh, so, you know, go forward and do these things uh, that I that I command you to do is what basically Kim Jong-un told his uh, national defense sector. And, and they've been busy. Uh, September mm-hmm. and October 2021, they introduced quite a new range of capabilities. Most of the tests that have happened this month in January are operational tests of missile systems that they've previously introduced, but they're just making sure that they work under wintry conditions, that they uh, have the ability to very rapidly conduct exercises. That's something that they've emphasized. Um, The first two tests in the year, however, were qualitatively new. The North Koreans demonstrated a new uh, maneuverable reentry vehicle, which is something that, uh, you know, you might want if you're trying to stress missile defenses in South Korea and Japan. Um, and um, make your missiles more difficult to track and defend against more generally. Uh, And what was really interesting, Katie, is that, you know, Kim Jong-un himself, uh, since 2019, um, has stopped personally guiding every single missile test. Uh, He used to sort of be at every single missile test himself. Um, And what was interesting is that he actually returned for the first time since, I believe, March 2020, to guide a missile test uh, at the uh, the second test this month in January. And so he's sort of, again, you know, becoming more visibly involved with all of this. So uh, that's sort of the bigger picture here. Uh, and then there's a diplomatic context here with China, the United States, the international community, sanctions and all that that we can uh, talk about. Yeah, I was I was going to ask, you know, do you anticipate sort of the missile testing pace to um, peter out for February? You know, Beijing is going to be hosting the Olympics. Uh, it might be at least reported as a negative um, for North Korea to be uh, firing missiles while while um, world leaders are gathering in Beijing. But uh, I'm curious what you what you think about the the future. I imagine this kind of pace can't be kept up in, indefinitely. Um, but what what do you think about that? And then added to that, you know, what is the view from uh, the rest of East Asia? You know, there's been a lot of coverage of you know is this testing Joe Biden? But what is South Korea thinking about this? What is uh, Japan thinking about this? And what is what is China thinking about this this missile testing? It's happening much closer to them. Yeah, the China piece is probably a good place to start. Uh, so, you know, relations between China and North Korea were actually quite bad between end of 2013 and end of 2017. Uh, they sort mm. of really began to pick up in March 2018 when Kim Jong-un rode his train to Beijing and met with Xi Jinping for the first time. Uh, and since then, the two countries have increased their contacts. Uh, you know, there's this pervasive notion that China and North Korea are, you know, shoulder-to-shoulder allies uh, walking in lockstep. That couldn't be further from the truth. The North Koreans have always sort of mistrusted uh, all the major powers, China included, mm-hmm. Russia included, and certainly the United States, of course. But, um, you know, the point on testing and China's diplomatic calendar is interesting because when relations were poor, you know, the North Koreans launched missiles. Let me see. Let me see if my memory serves <laughs> me. During the Hangzhou G20 meeting in, 20, uh, in 2016, the North Koreans launched, I believe, three missiles. Uh, Mm -hmm. During the Belt and Road Forum's inaugural meeting in 2017, uh, they launched missiles. Uh, I think they launched missiles during other prominent Chinese Communist Party plenums. Uh, Mm -hmm. So they haven't really been uh, very respectful of China's internal uh, political and diplomatic calendars. The Winter Olympics are interesting because I think think right now, uh, so China has basically, uh, you know, there was a UN Security Council meeting this month uh, where the United States wanted to uh, discuss North Korea. And China basically said... Look, we're not going to support new sanctions. This is basically on the United States for not playing ball with North Korea in the diplomacy that happened in 2018 and 2019. Uh, and so the Chinese are still backing North Korea publicly at international forums. And, you know, there's other variables that explain this, which is that mm-hmm. the geopolitics have changed between the U.S. and China tremendously since 2017, for instance. Um, but I think, you know, from the Chinese perspective, um, the Winter Olympics might actually matter less than the 20th Party Congress later this year. Uh, which mm. I think is a much bigger deal for uh, Xi Jinping. Potentially, uh, you know, Xi might indicate his plans to remain as leader for life or announce some kind of successor. It's 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 not known yet. Um, so I suspect the North Koreans are going to front load a lot of their testing into the first half of this year. 
Mm. And the other reason I think that is because, well, Kim Jong-un, you know, so the, the, not only have the North Koreans launched a bunch of missiles, but they've also had uh, several important political events this year. Uh, we had the New Year's Day address. We had a Politburo meeting mm -hmm. after the United States announced new sanctions. And what Kim Jong-un said was that um, two important anniversaries are coming up for the North Koreans. Uh, the 80th anniversary of Kim Jong-il, Kim Jong-un's father's mm -hmm. birthday, is February 16th. That's coming up mm -hmm. just in a couple weeks. Um, and Kim Il-sung's, uh, the founder of North Korea, Kim Jong-un's grandfather, his birthday, uh, the biggest holiday on North Korea's calendar is on April 15th, and it's 110th. Uh, and Kim basically said that he wanted both of those anniversaries to be celebrated with splendor. Now, historically, it's not always true that when the North Koreans have big holidays, they do something big to celebrate, like a missile test or a nuclear test. Uh, but Kim has also indicated that he might be shedding his um, self-imposed moratorium on, longing, on launching long-range yeah. missiles. So it might stand to bear then that these two anniversaries might coincide with the testing of longer range capabilities that the North Koreans haven't tested since 2017. Mm -hmm. uh, they could also just do a military parade or, or something else to commemorate the occasion. It, it, I think, remains to be seen. They could do a satellite launch. Uh, so there are a lot of possibilities. Uh, so in terms of the petering out, I would expect, you know, it's going to be a rocky first half to 2022 at least. Uh, there's been a big emphasis right now. On, on launching capabilities. Uh, the North Koreans have also really reacted poorly to the fact that the Biden administration announced new sanctions against them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Kim in October 2021 uh, told the United States that, you know, he doesn't really care about the words that are coming out of the Biden administration because the Biden administration, to their credit, has been saying a lot of the right things, right? Uh, they've been saying mm -hmm. that, we d we're not hostile to North Korea. Uh, we don't want to change the regime. Uh, we will meet North Korea anywhere, anytime to talk about anything. And as far as Kim Jong-un is concerned, none of that is impressive because uh, he wants to focus on behaviors. And mm -hmm. the most significant behavior in North Korea's estimation is the sanctions. And the North Koreans have basically interpreted that to mean that the Biden administration is just like all of its predecessors, right? The old pattern is that the North Koreans launch missiles, the U.S. sanctions them, and, you know, goes into a cycle. So, uh, yeah, overall, I'm not very optimistic that, uh, you know, this is going to peter out anytime soon. Okay. Um, and I, I guess I have one more question that I, I really want to ask you on this, because I know you've done a lot of interviews about North Korea recently. This is your area of expertise. You wrote a book about Kim Jong-un and his, his bomb, um, which is a great book, by the way. Uh, but, you know, when you're talking about North Korea and people are asking you questions about North Korea and missile testing, what are we missing? You know, do you think that we're focusing on sort of too much of this signaling aspect of missile testing? Um, you know, I'm, I'm curious, you know, what, what do you wish you someone would actually ask you about when it comes to North Korea and, and uh, missiles and, and the nuclear program? Well, so, I mean, you know, you've probably realized this by now, but I tend to focus a lot on internal, you know, internal North Korean explanations for what the North Koreans are doing. Um, mm -hmm. And I think a lot of the discourse and a lot of the reporting, uh, you know, does focus on the signaling thing. You know, I mean, for instance, you know, did the fact that Biden withdrew from Afghanistan prompt North Korea to launch missiles or, you know, is what's happening in Ukraine showing the North Koreans that the U.S. is weak? Does a butterfly you know? flap its wings in Brazil? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, you know, I... I all of that is, is, I think, a distraction, even if it makes for good headlines, I suppose. But, um, I mean, really, it's about taking the North Koreans seriously, right? Um, the North Korea, you know, I don't want to I don't want to make the North Koreans sound like they're easy to understand. Uh, by no means is that true. I mean, everything that we interpret from their state media, for instance, is, is carefully manicured propaganda for the precise consumption of outside analysts. Mm -hmm. um, but the North Koreans do tell us quite a bit, right? I think it's worth taking Kim Jong Un's words seriously. Uh, he tells us what he wants, to, uh, what he wants the North Korean national defense sector to do. You know, mm -hmm. you can also look at the newspapers. Uh, you know, you can look at North Korean state media. You can look at what they're telling their own people. Uh, for instance, you know, one thing I'll just highlight is that uh, just this past week, Katie, you know, there have been two missile tests. Uh, the North Koreans just reported on this in their state media. Uh, but the front page news in in Nodong Shinmun, the the newspaper of the Workers Party of Korea. The front page news wasn't that they launched missiles. This was sort of page three news. Uh, the front page news was that, you know, Kim Jong-un uh, toured a new um, agricultural facility uh, mm. and to indicate that, you know, food output is going to go up. And so the message is still very much economic uh, internally uh, because he's been very open about the fact that things are going poorly. And, and a lot of this, I think, really falls by the wayside where... We focus a lot on on the missiles um, and, you know, for good reason, they are, I think, meaningfully a, a threat to the region. But um, 
everything else that's happening in the country sort of uh, doesn't really get appreciated. And, uh, you know, I think um, that's that's really quite important, especially with diplomacy. I think COVID assistance, humanitarian aid are probably two of the areas where, you know, I think there's an opportunity to seek out some kind of positive um, mm. outcome with the North Koreans. Right. Um, we can we can talk about how much we want denuclearization, but um, ultimately, I think looking at what the North Koreans are struggling with right now and um, I think interpreting what might be a useful place to start from that is uh, something we could stand to do a lot more of. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. You know, you can kind of look at this and see areas where there's potential for something um, as opposed to you know, a brick wall that has uh, been hard to surmount in a long time when it comes to the nuclear program. Um, well, I think that's all I've got. Do you have any other additional thoughts about no, I mean, unfortunately, I think we're going to be probably talking about North Korea, not too Yeah, I think we're going to come now. back to this again. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> I think, you know, we can we can leave it there for today, Katie. Uh, and, you know, I'll just, I guess the only other thing to flag is, uh, you know, we're uh, looking forward to an election in South Korea in March. Uh, North Korea policy is not a big part of that because uh, South Korean voters uh, tend to vote on um, along, you know, internal issues are much more important again. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, something to uh, flag for our listeners. Uh, so uh, good to good to join you, Katie. And uh, thanks for the great questions. Yeah, thank you very much.